in the summer of 2003, just a few years after migrating from Jamaica, I was living in Vancouver when I had my first real awakening to the fact that I was seen first as a black woman rather than just a human being. I was at a bus stop on West Georgia, West Georgia and Granville, and I had just come off another bus from, that came to me from UBC, that's the University of British Columbia. It was the last day, my last day there, and I had just completed a contract teaching at UBC. So I was feeling pretty good because, you know, UBC, and it was going to be the big deal that I would add to my resume. I was going home to update my resume because I kept hearing, you don't have enough Canadian experience, you don't have Canadian experience. And I was getting Canadian experience in smaller private schools, but not the big ones, you know? So that had been my goal. So the day the contract ended, I thought, yes, finally, I made it. So I was at the bus stop feeling good with myself, you know, singing, I'm gonna soak up the sun, really feeling positive because this was what I was, this was what I was dreaming of. So as I stood at the bus stop waiting, I looked at my watch and I thought, hmm, it's 4.20 and the bus isn't here. It was the 4.20 bus that I needed to take. So I looked up the road and I didn't see the bus. So I thought, hmm. And I continued waiting, feeling good with myself. And then I looked again and it was about 4.22. So I looked up again, thinking, this is Vancouver, buses are always on time. And when I looked up, I met cold blue eyes staring back at me. So, you know, I kind of whoa, thought that's weird. And I continued waiting and waiting. And then at about 4.25, when I looked again, I thought, really? So I looked up again, looking to see if the bus was coming. And this time, when I looked, the guy with the blue eyes kind of stuck his neck out a bit and he muttered something. And when he said it, I thought, no, I, I don't think, I don't think he said what I thought he said, because this is Canada. This isn't the US. So I stood there for a while wondering, did I hear it? Did, did, is, is that what he really said? So I guess, being a glutton for pain, I looked up one more time. And this time, he looked at me and he said, get out of here, you effing nigger. And he said the word, he said the actual F word. And when he said it, I was stunned. I was frightened. I was stunned and I didn't know what to do. So I looked at the guy beside me because in times of distress, you think the person beside you will help you, right? So I looked at the guy beside me, the well-dressed businessman in the blue suit, and he continued looking ahead. So I looked at the young adult beside me, a young guy, maybe in his twenties, and I did the sign to him and he did the don't look at me sign and i thought really really you're going to pretend that this isn't happening so i stood there waiting wondering what to do because i'd never been in a situation like that before so i thought okay maybe i just ignore him and then when i looked up i saw a bus coming i thought thank god a bus is coming then the commuter started to move towards the, 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 the line because the bus was coming and everybody wanted to get on the bus. And when I looked, I realized it was the 241, not the 246, which was the bus I needed. Now, when I saw almost everybody going towards that bus, I realized that I was going to be left behind with Mr. Blue Eyes 
and maybe three other commuters. So as I stood there trying to figure out what to do next, I looked up and he was walking towards me, walking towards me. And I thought, oh my God, I can't stay here. I can't stay here. I have to move, I have to move. So I quickly reached for my bag. I grabbed my bag and I started to move. Just, you know, walking at a decent pace. When I looked behind, he was walking too. So I picked up the pace a little bit more. And when I looked behind, he had picked up his pace also. So I rummaged through my bag. I grabbed my cell phone. I called my husband and said, honey, there's a guy behind me. He's coming and I don't know what he's going to do. And, and, uh, and before I knew it, the call ended. I had forgotten to charge the phone. This is 2003 when I wasn't that connected. So when I realized that I couldn't tell my husband where I was, I didn't have any friends in Vancouver because we were still new immigrants. I started to run and I ran and I ran, looking behind me and I ran and I ran and I ran and I ran. So I started with that story because I wanted to demonstrate how to use an attention grabber at the beginning of your oral presentation. So if you'd like to know about a few strategies that you can use, and if you want to know how that story ended, I'm going to invite you to stick around because I'll answer your questions in a few minutes. Hello everyone, I'm Tanya. I'm a corporate trainer and a college instructor. I teach communication and I've been teaching for the last 31 years. I teach interpersonal, business, and oral communication, which will be the focus of today's video as it was in last week's video. The aspect of oral communication that we'll be focusing on will be, well, let's just call it public speaking, right? The aspect that we're gonna be looking at is the attention grabber which is really the most challenging part of any speech. You see, in the 20 years that I've been teaching public speaking, I would say that maybe 10% of the speeches I've heard have had good attention grabbers, 10%. And I may be a bit generous when I say 10%. Most people struggle with the attention grabber. So in today's video, we're gonna be talking about the attention grabber. We're de dedicating an entire video to just talking about the first part of the speech because that first part is the most important part. I'm gonna give you a definition. I'm gonna tell you what an attention grabber should do. And then I'm gonna give you examples of three of the best types of attention grabbers. But first, I'm going to start with what you should not do when you have your attention grabber. The first thing you should not do is come to the mic and say, um, uh, my name is, do not do the my name is start. That is not an attention grabber and you don't need to do that ever. So don't start with my name is. The next thing you do not want to do is apologize. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't get enough time to prepare this. Oh, um, bear with me guys, I'm not really a public speaker. Don't do any of those things. And the third thing that you should not do is, um, can everyone hear me? Uh, those of you at the back, are you, are you hearing me? Now people do those things because it gives them a chance to build their confidence. But even if you think it's something that will help you, it will not help your audience and it will not make you look good with your audience. So do not do any of those things. Matter of fact, when you get up, now you may have a mic or you may not have a mic. You may be standing in front of 10, 20, 100, 1,000 people. Doesn't matter how many people that you're gonna be standing in front of. Stand. And when you stand, pause for one, two, three seconds and then begin. Don't just rush to the mic and start talking. 
stand, collect yourself, let the audience wonder, what's this all about? Let them begin to anticipate what you have to say and then begin speaking. Okay, so let's talk about what an attention grabber is. The definition of, a, of an attention grabber is a hook, really. It is the thing that grabs attention. It arrests attention. It causes curiosity. It makes people lean forward. But it is not a passive action. It has to have action. It's not passive, it's active. Now, think about this. I'm in my 50s, okay? And let's say I'm talking to another friend also in her 50s. And as we're talking, she says to me, you know, um, I don't know why I'm feeling like this because I know it was only 20 years ago that I had Rory, but this pregnancy is not turning out the way. Whoa, whoa. What did you just say? This what? Pregnancy? What? Okay. That was an attention grabber. When she said this pregnancy, I thought, whoa, 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 stop right there. And that's what an attention grabber is supposed to do. It's supposed to make the audience, whoa, what did you say? Whoa. And they should lean in. And that's what you're trying to do. Get your audience to lean in. Now, some people think that they can do any attention grabber because this is good. It's going to make people listen. Like the story about the, the woman who was pregnant at 50 odd. If I ever did an attention grabber like that, it should be because I'm doing a speech about women who are pregnant later in life or something like that. The attention grabber must be directly related to whatever you're talking about. You should be able to give the attention grabber and then say something like, so that's why I'm going to tell you about. No, that's not the structure that you will follow, but when you've done your attention grabber, make that the test. Find out if after you say it, you can say, so that's why I'm going to tell you about whatever it is you plan to talk about. If it doesn't flow from the attention grabber to what you're gonna talk about, it means it's not an appropriate attention grabber, which means you need to change it. So first thing is your attention grabber must grab and snatch attention like a hook. Because that's what a hook does. It grabs. And that's what your attention grabber must do. If you give your attention grabber and people are like, okay, then you haven't caught their attention. So one, it must grab their attention and it must be like a hook. And two, it must be directly connected to your main idea or your thesis or your premise or your main points. And you will know that if you can at the end of your attention grabber say so that's why i'm going to talk about so please keep that in mind now one of the first good attention grabbers is a question so you start your presentation with a question and let me first say that an introduction in itself the introduction for the speech has five parts okay the speech first has three parts an introduction a body and a conclusion we know that and the introduction must have five parts now in next week's video we're going to talk about the five parts but in today's video i'm only focusing on the first part of the five which is the attention grabber now back to what i was saying the attention grabber as a question it has to be a question that actually once again snatches people's attention now if you say something like how many of you have pets i don't but that's not an attention grabber it's a question but it's not an attention grabber why because an attention grabber as a question must cause people to reflect it must make them think it must make them wonder you know it has to have a reaction. It can't be a yes or no question because for yes or no questions, it's just, 
How many of you like living in Vancouver? I do, I don't. There's no reaction there. But if I were to say something to you like, if you found out that a relative that you really, really loved was in fact a murderer, you found this out just accidentally, what would you do? Would you confront the person? Would you tell another family member? Or would you go to the police? Or would you just pretend that you did not know? Which would you do? Now, that's a question. And can I also say that when you ask a question, you must pause. You must allow a moment or two or three for your audience to think and reflect. If you say, what would you do? No, I know what I would do because I, no, you have not even given them a chance to think. But let's say you said, what would you do? Would you go to the police? Pause, two, three. Would you tell another family member? Pause, two, three. Would you confront the person? Pause, two, three. What would you do? And that's how you tell a question. That's how you ask a question as an attention grabber. You ask a question that causes reflection, that causes people to think, a question that is thought provoking, and you pause and you wait. Now you don't expect them of course to answer, but you have to give them a chance. And you will know when you see the eyes rolling up. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And believe me, that energy, when you feel it, it's gonna be so motivating for you that you're just gonna give it your all after that. So remember, ask a question that doesn't have a yes or no answer and pause and wait. Now another good attention grabber is startling information or a startling fact. The bottom line is something that causes people to say, wow, really? Why? Because once again, you want to snatch them up and you want them to lean in. And if you say something like, the sky is blue, nobody's going to react to that. And if you say something like millions of people die each, each year because of smoking, nobody is going. Why? Because we've, we've heard it all before. It's not novel, it's not new. So everybody's gonna just be like, okay, get on with it. What's the next thing you have to say? Now, if I were to say to you, even though we've been told from when we were young until now, we've heard that we have five senses. I'm here to tell you today that we don't have five senses. We actually have about 20 senses, including hunger and thirst. Now, have you ever heard that before? Because I never heard that before until I read it. And if you are going to use startling information, it has to really be unknown. It must make people say, really? Are you serious? Are you kidding me? Wow, well, I didn't know that. And if you get that reaction, and you will know when you look at the faces of your audience members, when you get that reaction, you know, you scored. So that's the second thing you can do. You can tell something startling, or you, it can be statistics also. Did you know um, every five minutes so-and-so happens? It has to be true though, of course, it has to be true. But what I'm saying is make sure that it's information that will make people surprised. So I've told you that you can do a question. I've told you that you can have startling information. And now the third strategy that you can use at as an attention grabber is story. My favorite 
type of attention grabber. Not just my favorite attention grabber, but the average audience member prefers to hear a story over any other attention grabber. Why? Because a story gives you a chance to have an emotional connection. When you hear a story, oxytocin is produced. And once oxytocin is produced, you feel empathy and you bond with the person that you're listening to. Once you hear a story, the other hormone that's, that's produced is dopamine. And even though people think of dopamine as a pleasure hormone, it's really the pleasure of anticipation. So if any of you who heard my story and want to know how it ended, that's because dopamine was produced. And that's because I left you with a cliffhanger, cliffhanger, no spoilers. Okay, no spoilers, okay? But if you want people to be curious and you do want people to be curious when you speak, then find a story that can produce dopamine. Now, for those of you who are saying, uh, but I don't have stories, that's true. We don't all have a story to tell, but there are different things you can do. Yeah, you can tell a personal story. And if you're telling a personal story, remember that it's not going to be effective if it's just a rambling of events that happened. I did a video, a four part video on how to tell a story. The first part, I told you that you need to find the emotional response. Find a story of something that happened in your life that created an, an emotional reaction. If there was no emotional reaction, then I would suggest not using that story because if it didn't touch you, it's not going to touch your audience. So first, make sure that the story had an emotional impact on you. Then you want to make sure that when you tell your story, you talk about the struggle because every story is a good story when there is a struggle because life is not a flat line but it has valleys so tell a story that has a valley as i said in my second video for that four-part series and the third thing you want to do is figure out the takeaway what do you want the audience to take away and if you can't find the takeaway in the story your audience surely will not find it either so make sure there was an emotional impact Make sure that when you tell the story, there was a struggle. Make sure that you know the takeaway. And when you have done that, you're ready to structure it with the beginning, middle, and the ending, which I spoke about in the fourth video. So the personal stories are the best stories. But let's say you can't find a personal story. You could, talk, you could tell a story about somebody else's life. Now I did a video some time ago where I also spoke about the student who spoke about grit. So let's say I wanted to talk about grit. I could use her story. I, ca I can't pretend it's mine, but I can tell you about the student who told us about how she was 16, living in the Philippines, found herself pregnant and had to learn the meaning of grit. Initially, she had just told us a dictionary meaning. And I said, no, we don't want the dictionary meaning. We want you to tell us a story. And she told us a story. And she told us what grit meant to her. Total game changer. We thought about her differently because we thought, this is a strong woman. And we also realized that a story elevates a speech way beyond what you could imagine. So tell a personal story, tell somebody's story, or make up a story. Or use a fable, use Greek mythology, use one of Aesop's fable. How about the story? Let's say you had to tell a story about teamwork. Simple, teamwork, right? You could try one of those fables. Now, I think many of you have heard the story about the father and the three sons, who kept fighting and fighting and fighting. So he gave each son a stick and he said, break the stick. And each person, each son broke the stick. 
And then he gave them a bundle of sticks. And then he said, break that now. And of course, they tried and they couldn't. And the moral of that story really is, unity is strength. When you're on your own, it's harder to break sticks. But when you're in a group and when you're a team and when you work together, there's nothing that can't be achieved. Not a true story, but it's a good story. So tell a story and it does not have to be your story, but your story is the best story. And if you think about it and you sit down, you can find stories. Believe me, you have a life full of stories. So in conclusion, I've just told you the definition of, of an attention grabber and I've likened it to a hook. And I've explained that you need to hook your audience attention. And remember, you really have five seconds to do that. Yeah, our attention span is limited. You have five seconds to hook your audience. If you don't use that, those five seconds well, you're gonna be on their phones, looking for something that's more interesting than you. So I've told you the definition. I've told you what your attention grabber should do. It should pull people in. And I've told you three types of attention grabbers that work very well. The question, the startling factor information, and the number one way, which is the story. If you use those strategies, I can guarantee you that your speech or your presentation will be elevated to nothing under an A type of speech. Not because you need it to be graded, but because you also want to be able to evaluate yourself. And you want to know, is this an A speech? Is this a B speech? Or is this a C speech? And guess what? We all want the A speech. Now, for those of you who are saying, Tanya, the story, how did it end? Well, let me tell you how it ended. Like I said, I was running and I was running and I was running and I ran for quite a few blocks until I saw the bus coming. So by the time I got to about West Georgia and Butte, the bus was there. I ran up the steps, I put my coins in and unlike Rosa Parks, I went to the back of the bus. I went to the back of the bus because I didn't want to be surrounded by anyone. I didn't want anyone to say anything to me. And I wanted to just cry. And that's what I did. I cried and I cried and I cried. All the way from the Butte bus stop, past Stanley Park, over the Lions Gate Bridge, along Capilano Road. I cried until I got to the bus stop at, that, that I took to get bus stop that led me home. I cried and I cried. And when I reached home, I called a Canadian friend and I said to her, this is what happened. And she said to me, are you sure? I said, am I sure that what? Are you sure you heard right? I, I don't think a Canadian would have said that to you. I said to her, so you think I was running along West Georgia because a ghost was running behind me? Do you really think so? And I was angry. I was really angry. But as I looked back at the time when I was at the bus stop, and as I got on the bus and I was crying, I think the thing that I was really thinking about was how I just, I, I just couldn't get over the fact that I was doing nothing. The only mistake I made really was making eye contact with the guy. He, does, he didn't know me. He'd never seen me before. We didn't have a conversation. And yet, and yet, he felt he had to call me that name. And it made me realize that I've done the same many times. I've looked at people and I've said, oh, they must be this, oh, they are that. 
And unfortunately, it's something we do all the time. And I learned that I couldn't do that anymore. I could not do that anymore because what you see on the outside, whether it's skin color or it's the face, whatever you see on the outside is not an indication of everything that the person is. Yes, I am black. Yes, I am from Jamaica. Yes, I have a Jamaican accent, but I am so much more than what you see. And for anyone who's ever felt the sting of prejudice, the sting of racism, the sting of being stereotyped, please remember that you are so much more than what people say you are. You are who you say you are. Because we all have this ideal self in our minds, this ideal picture of who we want to be. That is who you are. And that is who you are to strive to become. Don't worry about what people say. Don't get caught up with what people say. As much as you can, don't even listen to the negative comments. Remember who you are and who you are striving to become and focus only on that. Looking back, I'm not sorry that that incident happened. I'm no longer sorry. Why? Because it taught me and it led me on a quest to finding out who I really was and a quest to find out more about race and culture and color. And above all, it helped me to realize that I am many things, but one thing that I am not is an effing nigger. Thank you for joining me, guys. I know this video was longer than usual, but you know what, guys? I love teaching public speaking so much that I keep forgetting the time. I'm sorry, but thank you for sticking around. And for more videos like these, please join me every week. Like I said, sometimes it's oral communication, sometimes it's interpersonal communication, and sometimes it will be business communication. But either way, it's all about equipping you and empowering you to be a better communicator. So if you liked what you saw or heard, and if you want more of it, please leave some comments. Let me know some of the questions you have. Let me know some things you want to learn about and just let me know. I'd be happy to do videos that would meet the needs that you have. So until next time, please remember, like, share, comment, and subscribe. Where you see my face, press the button and put on your notification bell so that anytime I do a video, you'll be there. Thanks again, guys. And until I see you in the next video, bye for now.